Um, first, let me thank you for all joining. I know you've got options for how you spend your time, and we're delighted that you chose to spend it with us, and we'll endeavor to do our dead level best to make this worthwhile and to provide you some useful information. I'm very excited about today's guest. I've known Jonathan a long, long time. He's a well-known local architect. I guarantee you that he will give you some nuggets of gold to take with you. But I'm also thrilled to have him because he's been in my rotary for at least the last 15 years where I've really gotten to see him in action. He's a very thoughtful guy and I think you'll learn from the questions that I ask and the answers that he gives that he's given today's subject a lot of thought. So we're very excited. Before we get started, I wanna remind you, we've set aside 30 minutes for this interview. So I wanna be sensitive to your time, but he's agreed to stick around afterwards to make sure any questions that you have do get answered adequately. And so for that, stick around. Please post those questions in the chat room. And as we wrap up, I'll feed them to him and we'll make sure they get answered. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is John Foster. I'm the host today and uh, I'm the managing partner of, of um, Pathfinder Group. And we're a multidisciplinary family business consultancy. We really focus on trying to help family businesses realize their American dream through three things, planning, leadership development, and helping them create high performing cultures that are aligned with the founder's vision and mission. So you can learn more about us from my website and you can check that out later. Uh, before we get started, just so we have a sense of who's here, I'm gonna launch this poll. Simple poll, three questions, yes or no, um, owner or not. Please take a second and answer that so that we have a sense of who's on the line and I'll post the results as soon as you're done. Jeopardy music insert here. Yeah, that's where I should really get better at this. You're a bit of a techno nerd, Jonathan. You should help me with this. We can work on that after this. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, let me lock it down and, uh, and share it with all of you. So let's say 67% um, of you lease space. That should be an interesting conversation that you guys are having. Uh, trying to figure out how to, all of you are trying to figure that out. Uh, except a few, 33% haven't figured out. Maybe we could, you could give us your ideas in the chat room. And, uh, and a lot of you have already taken the initiative to get started. Congratulations on that. Um, so Jonathan, tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll get started. Happy to, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm Jonathan Moore, I'm the president of Envision Advisors. We are an owner's representative firm uh, based in Tampa, working nationally. Uh, we really lead organizations through the design and construction process when they may not have the time, knowledge, or interest to do so. Uh, it's it's a different language and the market right now is very volatile. So bringing a project manager in to run your project is really a cost effective solution. And I've uh, uh, been doing it for, uh, uh, this is going on our ninth year in business. I am a registered architect. Uh, I no longer practice architecture. I don't think I had the uh, attention span to sit in front of a computer and, uh, and, and draw. I only represent owners. Uh, I have a staff of seven people. Uh, wonderful project managers. Um, we're we're really real estate experts. Um, it, you know, we we have found ourselves in front of many media outlets uh, talking about markets or what might have happened with a bridge collapse or uh, uh, the fire at Notre Dame. Um, we're often often consulting uh, legal and uh, financial folks on trends, building forensics, uh, expert witnesses, really all things. Uh, of the built environment. Some of the projects that we've overseen include the Brian Glazer Family JCC, 
the new St. Pete Pier, which I hope everyone has checked out. Um, Waterside Place is a new uh, $85 million town center in Lakewood Ranch that we're building. Uh, the Tampa Theater, we're on our fourth project there and uh, many others. So we're, uh, I never know what I'm gonna get when I wake up. Um, it's just really everything in the real estate world that, that we're involved with. Well, and it's certainly true that today's topic is a part and parcel of the real estate world uh, at one level, as well as uh, employee safety at the other. It, it seems to me that we're awash in advice from publications, ads, all research claiming to have the answer. And frankly, it's a bit overwhelming to me and perhaps to some of the people that are on this webinar. From your perspective, where do we start? How do we get our arms around this topic of, of safety in the workspace given COVID? Sure, let me start by saying I hate all of these, the, 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 the go-to words, the new normal, um, post-COVID, you know, really, um, you know, what, what I always start with is common sense. Use your gut. I'm a bit of a germaphobe. Uh, my wife is much more of a germaphobe. So nothing has really changed in our world. Lysol and cleaning wipes are our friends. Uh, they, they need to be more of our friends in the workplace. Um, but that's only a start. Uh, larger workplaces need more comprehensive analysis, more, more of a cleaning solution. While you embrace this common sense, and we'll talk a little bit about office and workplace culture, janitorial services are, are now offering increased sanitation services of varying degrees. There's in you know, a weekly, monthly, even quarterly products that are proving to be successful in not only um, uh, COVID type sanitization, but you know, bacterial and viruses. I hope that we're going to see a much better flu season because of, um, because of the, 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 the proactive steps that we're taking in, in our communities. Reorganizing your office space, we'll talk a little bit about um, being mindful of social distancing is another very cost-effective way uh, to do this. But we need to remember that the weakest link is that asymptomatic carrier that is not embracing our workplace culture. Unfortunately, we need to assume and design around that, that careless asymptomatic carrier um, to, to really to get the best results. And again, the most effective cost, the, the most effective solution is common sense and that's free. Yeah, I think we've all seen the airline ads where someone's coming down the aisle spraying with an atomizer, disinfectant, or, or some material. God only knows what it is. We've seen the PSAs where the same thing is being done on subways. Uh, you know, and, and the implication is that whatever is in that jar is not toxic, is not harmful to us, but will kill the bacteria, the virus, or the virus, not the bacteria. Um, how can we be sure? How do we know? We're not trained. It, it, you're absolutely right. And I am not a chemist. Uh, I, I am not here to tell you what products work and what don't. Uh, I spend a lot of time reading uh, uh, MSDS sheets, uh, material safety and data sheets on multiple products. Um, and and I, I try to get as, as, as nerdy as I can to see what makes sense out there. And again, using your best judgment in, in looking at the data um, is really my best advice. Um, Lysol and bleach and hand sanitizers, you know, all work, but, but they only work on what I'll call a, a private level. If there's a private side of commercial workplace and a public side of commercial workplace, I'd, I'd want to put the the, the kind of the Clorox wipes, and I hate to use product names, but the, the wipes in, in the, the private world. Individuals should be responsible for cleaning their areas and, and creating that clean culture. Public areas certainly need a, a more structuralized um, uh, approach. And whether that's policy, we're probably doing away with the coffee and the snacks. Um, 
uh, as well as the, the cleaning. And those cleaning, you'll see keywords, uh, ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet uh, um, light uh, destroys the virus, electrostatic creates a, a, a coating on a surface that prevents uh, viruses from living. Um, and these sanitiza sanitization services uh, have a varying length to them, whether it's weekly, monthly, or quarterly, uh, depending on the, uh, the, the degree of chemical process that they're using. You know, the chemical process is one thing, the contents are another, the application is yet another. I, and this is just an aside, but yesterday um, the neighbor was cleaning the adjacent wall and I could smell the Clorox and it was going into my beehives. And so, you know, I, I, I ran around to talk to him about what is he spraying? And he told me it was a mild 10% solution and, you know, a uh, happy ending. It didn't hurt the bees. But how do we know that people are being trained that they actually know the concentrations that are required in order to be effective, yet not toxic to us? I would, I would ask for all of that reference documentation before you sign a contract for these services. Um, companies are popping up, you know, they're taking advantage of the market. I, I would look to those companies that, that have been in business and perhaps offered some level of sanitization services in the past. Uh, groups that have cleaned hospitals or uh, uh, medical facilities probably have a good head start on what those safe products are. Um, janitorial services that may uh, uh, buy a, a branch of uh, a sanitization or a chemical company. I would ask for all of those licenses, insurance, the uh, manufacturer safety and data sheets on the product to determine the level of safety that, that you're exposing your employees, clients, customers to. That, that's critical. I'm on a board of a public company and we're having conversations about the liability. Um, you know, on the one hand, you want to do the right thing and, and bring people back into a safe environment. But some law firms, some lawyers are positing the notion that just compliance with the CDC guidelines just might not be enough. And so your advice is solid advice. Um, Dr. Fauci and locally our own Dr. Charlie Lockwood of USF Health has really preached the gospel of hand washing and social distancing as the foundation of good practices for preventing infection. Uh, the workplace brings us all together and creates challenges that can make that somewhat difficult. As a practical matter, how do we implement this advice and maintain it in that difficult work setting? Mm -hmm. First of all, everybody's talking about getting the tape measure out and measuring six feet from workstation to workstation. Uh, Certainly that's, that's a first approach. Uh, I've seen companies that, that have actually uh, modified their flooring, their carpet to, to put a six foot grid or design in place, uh, knowing that someone walking up to a desk still needs that, that level of separation. But there's lots of other out of the box ways of doing it. Um, you know, my business relies on a, a lot of meetings, face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, I've seen companies uh, look to some out-of-the-box solutions. We are in Florida. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more utilization of outside spaces, and we have clients that have started asking us to add outside spaces. Finding a tree or a shaded area, there's cost-effective ways to bring shade to uh, an outside environment. The, the, the best story I've seen is, is a an organization that has these parking lot meetings for all of their sales reps. And I think there's, there's 20 of them and they've encouraged the, uh, the representatives to bring their own lawn chair and I, they give a prize away for, for the, the coolest lawn chair. You know, that, that helps with sanitization because everyone has their own chair. Uh, you form a, a wide big circle with everyone has six foot separation. So it's really, creating this, this not only cleaning culture, but, but culture of uh, the six foot bubble uh, and, and protecting that bubble. You know, I know, and you and I have had conversations about this long before we talked about developing this webinar, but you've been talking about airflow. So I become more familiar with 
air returns and air flow and the implications of that. Tell us a little bit about the research that you've done and how we can use air conditioning and an understanding of air conditioning to keep us safer. So here's, here's kind of the, the, where the rubber meets the road. I, I think that there is more to air movement and the spread of COVID than um, the mainstream media is talking about because I'm in this world and, and I see how air moves. Um, there have been studies out there that show uh, air movement either uh, protects or, in, or, or allows uh, the spread of the virus. So as far as your air conditioning goes, there's, there's easy ways, uh, kind of medium ways and hard ways to modify uh, the, the way your workspace responds to air conditioning. The first thing that I do in any space that I go in, restaurants, office space, is I find the return air duct. That's the grill that pulls air into the air conditioning. And it's usually the one that, that either whistles or is the loudest. Um, uh, once I locate that one, then I look at all of the other grills in the ceiling and know that they're, they're blowing air out. So the air conditioning systems are a circle. They're circulating. They, they recirculate the air. So they, they push air out and they pull it in. And if you can picture air blowing out of uh, a supply duct and moving across the floor, because cold air sinks, to the return air and then pulled up into the return air, you start to understand the main uh, patterns of airflow in the space. And I think the, the, the way to maximize prevention is to keep as few people as possible uh, in that line of airflow to the return air. If, if you think about someone sneezing, maybe directly under a supply duct where the air is blowing, and then that, that airflow moves across four or five people before it's sucked up into the air vent, well, that, that air is just, those, those airborne vapors have just passed through that many people. Um, so I, I map that out and you can rearrange the office accordingly um, to, to really avoid that, that multiple person path of air. A little harder, there's filtration systems out that you can put in your existing system. Ultraviolet lights uh, can come and adapt to your existing air conditioner for, for not a whole lot of money. There are HEPA filtration systems that can be installed in existing ductwork. Uh, and there are air scrubbers that you can add that are freestanding systems that pull air in, filter it electrostatically, and, and blow it back out. Those are typically ground mounted sitting on the, on the floor. Um, the most expensive is you could introduce more airflow into the space. You can do that by fresh air or, or just introduce larger systems to increase the number of air exchanges per hour that, that uh, move through your space. Now, you don't want to work in a wind tunnel, so there's a very careful balance, and I definitely work with an engineer to figure that out. But, but again, easy is mapping out your airflow. Medium is those filtration systems that you could put in your existing system and hard is major surgery on your air conditioning to increase airflow or fresh air. Good explanation. You know, there's an old saying, never waste a good crisis. And given the flood of newfangled products being hawked as must have solutions for our offices, it seems that this is never more true with a lot of manufacturers and distributors. Um, I'm sure you're able to kind of filter out the wheat from the chaff. So tell us about some of the more credible solutions that you found in your research. Sure. There's, there's the no-brainers out there. The, the less you touch, the more the virus uh, it, it does, doesn't spread. So all of the hands-free devices that you can think of in the bathrooms, uh, toilet, sink, uh, hand towels, and I do recommend hand towels as opposed to uh, uh, dryers. The dryers then, uh, again, increase that, that airflow unpredictability that, that I think we really need to get a better, do a better job of mapping that out. So, so I would say um, maximize the hand-free opportunities that you could find in your workplace. Um, minimize the public touch services, again, 
sorry to say that the coffee and water cooler are probably going to go to the wayside and, and left to bottles of water, uh, uh, maybe individualized wrapped snacks. Um, I want to teach you a new word today that, that uh, it is very interesting in my world. There are nanoseptic surfaces, and, and these surfaces um, utilize nanotechnology to prevent bacteria and viruses from growing on them. Um, these are being applied to door handles, uh, pushes, uh, work surfaces. I saw a mouse pad that had uh, nanoseptic surfaces. You can even buy them in uh, self-adhesive uh, um, panels. And, and again, these restrict the, the virus from surviving on the surfaces with their, their own level of nanotechnology that I couldn't speak of. But, but again, finding opportunities to kill the virus either on contact, knowing that it might be a week or so before that cleaning company can come in and do that sanitization. How do you uh, tackle it immediately? And, and the nanoseptic surfaces, hands-free surfaces or hands-free devices are, are really great solutions that, that we are taking advantage of with several of our clients right now. You know, we, we build this talk around, uh, at least in part, on, on cost-effective ways that we could re-engineer safe workspaces. And you've touched on some of the common sense ones and touched on a few of the products or services that we could avail ourselves to do that. Um, is, it, is it realistic, first of all, to be able to solve the problem without budgeting something beyond just services. And, and in terms of budgeting, what's a realistic range per employee or per square face, per, per square space, square footed space, to really get our arms around a practical way to fund this uh, solution of this problem? Yeah, I've, I've looked at a few of our, our clients in the hospitality and commercial office world and I, I want to throw out a $500 to $1,000 per employee cost, to, depending on that, that level of um, public access you have to the space. The $500 per employee would be more of a, a, a investing in a sanitization service and, and more regular janitorial services, uh, along with perhaps some hands-free devices. That thousand dollar per employee, uh, you can really start to do some some great things with air conditioning. Uh, but I'm going to call five hundred to a thousand dollar per employee a great rule of thumb to start with. Does that change as we have more employees? In other words, you know, if I have five hundred employees um, versus fifty employees, could I expect to? I, I would that... think it would, but I I, I probably wouldn't want to go much lower than five hundred. Thinking about the sophisticated air control systems in an environment with 500 people. Uh, I mean, that gets into the potentially millions of dollars. So I, I think you'll find that, that the 500 to $1,000 would even hold true in the 500 person. You know, I think about this when I, when I hear what you had to say, I think about it in phases, the free things that we can do that are based on common sense that we've all heard and understand how to do social distancing, uh, washing our hands, et cetera. Uh, the modifications that we might make to the actual space. Um, but then there are some behavioral things that we haven't touched on. What role do you see culture in an organization playing so that, for example, that asymptomatic carrier is compliant for the benefit of the organization? Culture is everything. Um, setting expectations uh, and comfort levels right from the start um, is key to, to bringing employees, clients, and customers back to the workplace. Uh, putting things in writing, broadcasting it, making sure both your, your in-house employees and the public are familiar with the steps that you're taking to uh, keep them safe. Uh, I, I think is is key, and you don't see a whole lot of companies doing that right now, and and that's really what's going to 
separate those who are, are just moderately getting through and, and might have to go into some uh, self-isolation uh, scenarios to the ones who really feel comfortable and, and know that people can feel comfortable saying, would, would you mind putting a mask on if, if that indeed is uh, something that the culture has decided to embrace? And ultimately, that's, that's where your profitability is going to be in communication to um, your, what I'll call key stakeholders. And everyone that comes to your workplace is a key stakeholder with regards to COVID prevention um, and communicating your solution to them, um, posting signage saying, you know, this is done, this is, you know, meet, meet our new nanoseptic surface or notice you don't have to touch anything in the bathrooms. Um, Really, I find that communication to be the the best solution to bringing people back uh, as comfortably and quickly as possible. Um, I want to remind everybody to go ahead and post questions in chat or Q and A, and uh, I'll use that as a segue to a question that Eric has asked: um, Is it required that we must post mask required for people to enter? I, I am not, and again, this, this is different everywhere. We're currently working in New York City and Tennessee, all over the state, and all of the mask laws are different. Um, I, I would say if, if there are laws out there, you, you would need to follow those law as a, laws as a business owner. Um, but I, I, I have been in offices that have, have required masks, but then some that have not required masks. Uh, I, I tend to live on the uh, proactive and protective side and, and typically wear a mask uh, un until I'm told I don't have to. Uh, so going into a space knowing that it's it's better for everyone in that office for me to walk in with a mask on, um, I'll typically do that. Thanks. I don't see any other questions. Uh, wait, wait, there's something. Here's one. Do you think bigger companies will have teams on premises who are watchers or guiders to make sure people do the right thing. Before it would be a holiday party teams. Now it might be COVID-19 central teams just to keep people safe and perhaps offering prizes for best practices and follow through. I've, I've definitely seen new company positions uh, be put in place uh, with, uh, work, with regards to workplace safety, um, COVID prevention, uh, once programs are in place, you you are going to need someone to enforce it, and you hope that that again your key stakeholders, everyone in the workplace, are enforcing it. But uh, ultimately, someone will need to oversee it uh, and make sure communications are current. You know, it's a public relations problem also um, that you want to make sure the word is not only getting out to your employees, but also to your potential customers to say welcome back. Uh, we believe you're going to be safe here this is why come and join us well and uh, and i will say that you know passion my passion is 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 culture within organizations and to the extent that an organization has invested in creating a culture that's aligned with this kind of messaging then you're not going to have as much um assertiveness or aggressiveness when you go around in those roaming teams and try to get people to nudge people into compliance. So um, if there are no more questions, Jonathan, do you have any parting thoughts or comments? You know, I, I again, appreciate this opportunity. I, I think that uh, in this new normal, and I'm sorry for saying that, um, we really have to be democratic in the decisions that we're making and get the buy-in from, uh, from everybody, all, all of the staff uh, that that is going to help protect the integrity of your post-COVID workplace solutions. So um, be sensitive to those people who are uh, uh, very paranoid about the virus and, and as well be sensitive to those people who may not believe the virus is a threat. Um, I, I tend to think we're a little somewhere in the middle, but that's for another show. Uh, again, be, be kind to one another, especially in the development of these programs and then Get, you know, get everyone to sign the document. Um, put it up proudly that this is what we're doing. Um, I hope I've taught you something uh, about airflow uh, and that, that you look at air conditioning a little different. Maybe the next time you're in a restaurant, 
don't sit next to that return air duct uh, because you're pulling everyone's sneezes towards you. Um, uh, maybe I'm sad I'm told, I told you that because uh, now that table is always going to be uh, occupied and I won't be able to get the table at the far side of the room. <laughs> You know, that's a great segue into another question that Tony just posed, and, and we've all seen it. We've seen, and it's generally younger people who violate this. The masses at Villanova, for example, the crowd at Villanova, crowd at Notre Dame, the parting that generally younger people who, and I remember this as far back as I have to work to remember it, we we felt invincible, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're vital and vibrant and healthy. But what can we do to, to address the total disregard that we see amongst young people in particular uh, as they gather? I wish I had a solution. Um, the, the technologies that are out there to map the symptomatic carriers with regards to fever, um, there are cameras that you don't have to stand in front of that, that automatically take your temperature uh, before you'd enter a building. Um, uh, there, there are staff that could take the temperature. Unfortunately, it's that asymptomatic, carefree uh, person who will break down every aspect of what I told you today, with the exception of workplace culture. If you can get the buy-in, from your entire team to protect our house, um, that is your best defense in bringing workers back safely. That's a great way to end. Um, I want to thank everybody, because we're at the top of the hour, uh, for attending today uh, and remind you that we'll not only be sending out a links to the audio and video version of this for your future reference, but Jonathan's put together a COVID boot camp checklist, uh, and we'll be sending that along to everybody as well, so they can just peruse it and see whether or not you're in line with uh, with the ideas that he'll put in that checklist. So, um, with that, I want to thank everybody for your time and effort. Stay strong, stay safe, Jonathan. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time and contributions. Definitely you, nuggets of gold. All right.